everyone. Um, I just want to start off by saying please bear with me as I go through this. I've never actually done this before and I'm doing it from my couch in my living room. There's no other better way to set up for, for me here in my home. <laughs> I wish I had my office set up but I don't. So you have to bear with me and hopefully we can get through these next couple of chapters. I don't really think it's all that important that you can see me good because I've tried lighting in other areas of my house and it's to no avail. It still looks as dark as what you're seeing right now. So I do want to start off with chapter 10. I think it's really important to discuss suicide. Suicide is one of the leading causes of death right now in the United States. And as you guys are aware, suicide rates have increased dramatically. As you probably know, here in El Paso alone, suicide rates are at an all-time high, and it's particularly with our military populations. Right now, Fort Bliss is rated, I believe, it's the second base, and it is one of the largest bases across the United States with the highest suicide toll rate right now. And just in the past year alone, the suicide statistics are very high. If I were to tell you what the statistics are of patients right now at UBH, I would have to say that approximately 82% of them have had suicidal ideations of some kind. So let's proceed and let's understand the diagnosis of suicidal ideations, which you would see on an AXIS-1 as an SI. It's not in the DSM-4, however, it is important that it goes on an AXIS-1 and that it is recognized in the treatment plan and also it is important that you look at those GAF scores so when you look at the DSM-4 or you look at that multi-axial assessment checklist that I gave you the cheat sheet that's in doc sharing you're going to notice that it has the GAF scores and anybody who is suicidal is automatically falling underneath that 50 mark range and remember what I told you about anybody who ranks under the 50s that they are inpatient um, prospects, basically. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the PowerPoint for suicide. Hopefully you're able to open it up on your computer and put it off somewhere to the side, or maybe you can print them out or something that you can look through them as we go through our lecture. Because I'm going to go ahead and follow those outlines, and I'll just kind of add in some material. It's a little different trying to do it this way, because when I have your all's interaction, it kind of guides me what you need to know and how much you already know. So I apologize if I repeat myself or if I give you information that is already common knowledge. Just bear with me. So right now when we look at suicide, and I'm just looking at my iPad here just so you know, so that I can follow along on the slides. So if I'm not looking directly at the camera, just know that I'm doing that. So that if you're looking at them, we're following right on task. So it says on the first slide that it has been estimated that 1 million people die by it each year by suicide, more than 36,000 suicides per year in the U.S. alone. That's a huge percentage when you stop and think about it. Now, I don't know if you all are aware who ranks higher. Is it children, adolescents, adults? And when we think in terms of adults, we're talking young adults, middle-aged adults, and seniors. Right now, it seems to fall at the senior rate. Adolescence is right below that, and children. But in the past years alone, we've noticed that children have jumped up dramatically Okay, on that list. Now, any time that a person attempts suicide and they are unsuccessful, we call it a parasuicide. It's really important that these things get documented, especially in their behavioral health record. And I don't know how many times I, I have witnessed this that a patient comes in and the clinician is asking them if they've ever considered suicide and the patient says yes and they mark it down incorrectly as the patient having tried to commit made an attempt in the past or uh, they don't document it and we want to know why because people who are prone to suicide or rather to the ideations and have attempted before this is not something that we take lightly, and it's also something that doesn't get cured overnight. This person may continue, and it kind of shows you that kind of route that they take, 
that if a person is that so that depressed or anxious that it comes to that point where they get hopeless and they consider suicide that this is going to be a common thing for them somewhere along the time in their lives okay now if you look at the slides you may notice I may not go over all of them entirely because I've looked at some of them and yes it's good information but it's not necessarily necessary that I go through all of them okay now one thing to consider too is that most suicides are accidental deaths not most not all people who have suicidal ideations and attempt are successful and I don't know if you know the difference about the two about who is more successful is it the men or is it the women who are more successful at committing suicide and you will find that it's generally men why because if they're going to do it they're going to complete and men have a little bit more strength and power or willpower anyway to to follow through women on the other hand not to say that they're weak or to question their ability to follow through but generally speaking women are more afraid to do some to commit those acts not to mention that their ideas of committing suicide are a lot different most women will generally try an overdose or um, cutting whereas men might use more um, threatening manners or or ways that are almost guaranteed to ha be a completion like the use of guns or other weapons hanging things of that nature now this is not to say that all people who commit suicide are because of depression or anxiety but usually we often find that people who are predisposed to committing an act of suicide they've had some history of mental illness in their lives slide number four says Schneidman uh, defines suicide as an intentioned death a self-inflicted death in which one makes an intentional direct and conscious effort to end one's life he characterizes four kinds of suicide seekers and this is important and I'll tell you it's only important because it's a theory but right now what you will notice is that in our field we use different kinds we say a person is either suicide ideations which means they think about it uh, suicidal attempts which means they have attempted before in the past suicidal ideations with a plan and if they have a plan we try to look at the ability for them to follow through on such a plan is it realistic is it something they can actually do and what is the, the level of severity or lethality rather is that are these plans almost guaranteed to cause a completion of death okay so we also know that people who are suicidal are those who constantly think about it it becomes a norm for them it becomes something that rather than problem solve or decision make they turn to suicide always okay which Needman comes up with one is death seekers and death seekers are clearly intent to end their lives which m means more than likely they have already thought of a plan they've already seen how effective it could be and they're just waiting for the opportunity to follow through a death initiator is they intend to end their lives because they believe that the process of death is already underway usually we see things like that in people who are terminally ill or people have already reached that level of hopelessness or helplessness that they think this is it there's no other way so I'm already considering that this is my only option then you have your death ignorers do not believe that their self-inflicted death will mean the end of their existence um, we've seen this in some of those mass suicides right um, different situations where people got together like I I'm sorry I went for a blank right there but I cannot remember that exact cult I think it was called mm, Heaven's Gateway or something like that when they all got together and they believed that the UFO was going to come down and pick them off so they did this mass suicide um, and they just believed that it was just going to remove them from this world and take them into another world the spirit world right and you got your death dares who have ambivalent ambivalent feelings about death and show this in the act itself um, he goes on to explain that one a little bit more although right there it's kinda of questionable what that means because we know that ambivalence means an indifference um, so they really could care less if they're alive and they could care less if they were dead 
and they do careless acts or I guess behaviors that at any point in time they could probably die in the process but to them it wouldn't really matter anyway and uh, we I've only seen that maybe once in a client that I can honestly say that that is a true definition or that theory serves a purpose because I did have one patient at one point in time who did a lot of daredevil acts. He was skydiving, he was bungee jumping, base jumping, doing all kinds of things that he knew. I could possibly die, but I don't really care. He'd mix medications with alcohol. It was that kind of thing. I mean, we put him in patient several times, and he did a real good job at playing that role enough to get out. But then as soon as he got out there, he was up to the same old acts, and the family would end up bringing him back in. He was a very young man. But he also had a predisposition because it ran in his family. His biological mother had committed suicide, and before that, the maternal grandmother. So it kind of was a process. It seems that everybody in the family felt that way. And they, that's generally a pattern you might see. Okay. So what is suicide, exactly? Well, we know that the word defines a pattern of behavior and a way of thinking that some people have. But according to your slides, it says, When individuals play indirect, hidden, partial, or unconscious roles in their own deaths, Schneidman classifies them in a category called subintentional death. And if you look at your textbook, subintentional death, discuss a little bit about this is what they've been thinking about subconsciously. And they're going to follow through on it, but it's a process. And basically... They're thinking that they're doing everybody a favor to include themselves. So that agenda is pretty hidden. But they go through that process. And just for the record, if you ever get a client that comes in and starts talking about that they want to commit suicide or they're with family, and the family is a part of that assessment, and they're saying, you know, I think about this often and this is something I want to do. And the family's like, oh, he says it all the time, but he won't really do it strongly recommend that you talk with that family alone and not challenging that individual. And it's also really important that you as a clinician don't challenge them either. It's not, you would never want to say to a client, you know what, you've been saying that for a long time and you haven't done it yet, so I really don't think you want to. They see that as a challenge rather than you're there to help. Okay. Now, often I see a lot of clinicians also putting down in access that a person is into um, self-mutilation and self-mutilation cutting okay um, or doing anything along the lines like that like they might burn themselves um, yeah they do superficial cuts of the skin that does not mean that they're suicidal that's a totally different um, diagnosis and behavior aside from the suicidal behavior so that's important to know too Suicide researchers face a major obstacle, and I really love this slide because of what it says. It says their subjects are no longer alive. So doing research on individuals that may be suicidal as to what triggers that response in them uh, kind of is pointless. It's kind of mute, right? Because oftentimes the subjects don't live long enough to follow through with the research. And how do you really follow someone like that with hopeless means and not wanting to be here? There's a good chance that you're not going to be able to follow them or follow up on them as much as you'd like. Researchers use two different strategies to try and overcome this obstacle, and it's with partial success, and one is retrospective analysis, a kind of psychological autopsy. In doing this, we're able to identify if the purpose, if the individual purposely tried to commit suicide or if it was accidental. The other is studying people who survived their suicide attempts. In doing that, we're able to identify the behavior they had prior to the thought, the ideation, the plan, or the execution. And then afterwards, when they survived it, is there some kind of epiphany? Or is there, an, you know, like that aha moment, like clarity just set in, and suddenly they are feeling, you know what, I really don't want to do this. The fear, the anxiety, the act enough was to make pull me out of this uh, hopelessness or after that, are they disappointed and they try to attempt again? So those have been really the only two ways that researchers can identify what drives, what motivates suicidal behavior.
The suicide rates of men and women differ very much, kind of like what I told you, that men will use more le lethal methods to do that, more violent methods like shooting, stabbing, or hanging. And women tend to turn to those drug overdoses, like I was telling you in the beginning. So women have a higher attempt rate, because I don't know how many times I've seen women come in uh, with a uh, suicidal attempt of overdose, but they're not really aware of what kind of medications they could take or overdose that would actually be a completion. It's more like a scare. And the biggest one is taking too much aspirin. And as you are probably aware of, uh, overdosing on Tylenol, ibuprofen, or acetaminophen isn't enough to um, kill you. It, it really will have some bad side effects. Other, but other than that, it's not a real way to suicide completion. However, women who do have access to benzodiazepines or those kind of medications, certain psychotropic medications, those I would be very worried about. So when you have a patient who is suicidal, and say, for example, you don't always have them on the inpatient status, because the suicidal ideations could continue to be there, but the intent, plan, and lethality may not be there. So they could be on an outpatient status. And believe me, I've had some patients that are on outpatient um, and basically what we do is, once again, we look at the ideation, the plan, the intent, and the lethality. If it is below a 5, and generally speaking, we want it at least at a 3 and below. If that's the case, we can contract for safety. And contracting for safety, um, even though they're signing a contract saying that they're going to be safe and they're going to have crisis called numbers close by or family members, a support system, we know that that doesn't necessarily mean that they won't try, okay? But in signing a safety contract, it allows you to be protected um, by ethical means and also by the law because if that person were to leave your office and after you assess them and they say, well, I'm not suicidal, I'm not having those thoughts, I'm not doing any of those things, I'm safe, I have these people, and they you lay out all the phone numbers, everything in the contract states what they will do in the moment of disparity, then it doesn't hold you accountable for their behaviors and for their actions. On the other hand, if a person comes in and says, well, I'm thinking about it, but I really don't have a plan, I'm not really going to, don't um, overlook that and not do a contract. Because if they leave your office, they go home, and then suddenly all of a sudden they hit a moment of disparity and they decide they're going to take their lives, you will be held accountable for that. Okay. So it says here that women have a higher attempt rate, three times more than men, but men have a higher completion rate, which is four times more than women. Now, if we look at the patterns and statistics of suicide, we can recognize that there's a number of things that are very similar. We find that it's related to social environment and marital status. More than likely, most of the individuals who have committed suicide were found to have no close friends. They were not married. They were not in uh, personal relationships. Um, however, we do see and recognize a higher suicide rate among divorced people than married or cohabitating individuals. So when we used to think that divorce wasn't that big of a deal, and if you kind of look at our generation now and the way that things go, we've all recognized that it's easier to get married, it's easier to get divorced, it's easier to do a lot of those things. So we don't ever stop to think about the emotional value or impact that it has on people. And you do get those individuals sometimes that do treasure and value marriage. And like, say, for example, when I see this more frequently, like the suicide because of divorce or even bereavement, I see it a lot in, in the, my senior population. Because if you, see, I, I've had two or I want to say three clients in the past week alone in my senior group above the age of 50 that have been married for more than 20 something years and then all of a sudden the, the spouse decides that the marriage isn't for them anymore and they want out. And the depression is much harder for them to deal with. So we kind of have to take into account those developmental stages that people are going through sometimes and how that might lead to that feeling of loneliness. Then again, I also do recognize that there are some seniors that once they're older um, and the spouse passes on, and if it's usually the woman before the man, the man is shortly uh, follows right after her. And if not, he's already having suicidal thoughts. 
very rarely do I see women uh, feeling that way about their male uh, partner after they have passed. I don't know if that means anything or not, but um, I definitely see it to be a more pattern in men. It says here that according to the statistics in the United States that suicide seems to vary according to race. And right now, uh, the suicide rate among white Americans is twice that of African American, Hispanics, and Asians. Um, I'm not sure why, but I would counter that with by saying that, um, and it does say here too, that the Native Americans is well over that average of uh, Caucasian people in the um, across America, and it gives you a nice, wonderful uh, graph there that kind of outlines for you the different ethnicities and the numbers of the statistics as far as they rank um, for men and women. And as you can see, the numbers for males are extremely high in the white American and American Indian. So what triggers suicide? Because I think that's the all-time question that most people have, is why do people commit suicide? Not everybody does that. Not everybody thinks about it. And does it take that certain kind of person? I've had many students ask me, have you ever been able to prevent a person from committing suicide? Yes and no. As a crisis worker, I've been on situations where I get called to a call where a person is suicidal or they're in the process of attempt. I've also been present when somebody had already completed and it was too late for intervention. And then, of course, I've had those that have come to my care and with time, that eventually subsides and they're able to find wonderful problem-solving skills, coping uh, mechanisms and uh, strategies for dealing with everyday stressors. But... That isn't always the case. What I've always found, too, is just those individuals who are suicidal, and they really do have that intent, that plan, and it's kind of almost inevitable. I hate to say it, but there is no way to prevent somebody from committing suicide. If there is somebody who wants to follow through, it's almost inevitable that they will. They may not do it now, but as long as there is a predisposition and it's there in the back of the mind, it kind of blocks out their ability to identify uh, coping strategies. It's almost as if that just predominates their mind is how do I get out of this and how do I get out of this quick? So I have found that oftentimes that seems to be the pattern. Okay, so what it says here is that suicidal acts may be connected to recent events or cu current conditions in a person's life. Although such factors may not be the basic motivation for the suicide, they can precipitate from it. And I definitely believe that, that, you know, everybody makes fun of the country songs, right? The dog ran away, the wife left him, the lost the house, lost my job. But when you think about the number of stressors that a person can handle, or the amount of stress, when you can look respectively at your own life, and what you have experienced over your life, and whether or not you have been able to handle those. I always tell people when they ask, why did this have to happen to me? I often ask them, why not you? Why would you compare yourself to another individual about why did it happen to me and it didn't happen to them? When you could ask yourself, why not me? I'm obviously strong. I'm obviously I could handle these things. I can do all of these things. And it almost seems as if we are equipped with the mechanisms or the tools to handle the stress that exists in our life right now. Otherwise, none of you would contribute to that. In other words, if you couldn't handle the stress of a relationship, you wouldn't have one. If you couldn't handle the stress of children, you wouldn't have had any. And thus forth, you wouldn't have gone for a job or the kind of job or the field that you've chosen if you weren't equipped to handle it. So it's really important to kind of twist that and turn that on the client about, you know, why not you? These are some of the things that you have chosen to participate in, and this is just the natural consequences of what happens. But teaching somebody how to acquire those skills to manage those stressors is the hardest part. Because when they're too busy reflecting on why, why me, they don't do what I just said a minute ago about recognizing the why not me's, the strength and everything. They're saying, why me? I'm weak. I can't handle this. Why can't this happen to somebody else? 
So building up that esteem or building up their ability to counter that by creating an environment or creating or cultivating that confidence that they need that they can handle their own problems. That is the trick, okay? That is the hardest part to do. Common triggers include stressful events, mood, thought changes, alcohol and other drug use, mental disorders, and modeling. So it's important to know that everybody handles stress very differently. And we didn't get a chance to finish the anxiety disorders, but in the process of that, we were going to cover stress, which we'll get to um, the following week. And then it'll all begin to make a little bit more sense, okay? Now, one stressor that has been consistently linked to suicide is combat stress. And probably precisely because it's such a break in reality. It's so surreal. Um, you know, the military can train several people for the jobs that they do. And they could do a wonderful job at it, but they never train them on how they're going to feel about things when they get there. That's subjective. And you, I don't believe anybody could ever prepare somebody for what they see and experience when they get into a combat situation. Both immediate and long-term stresses can be factors to suicide. And this is very true. And just as we spoke about it, some immediate stressors or long-term, immediate, which we call acute, or long-term or long-lasting is what we call chronic. And to have chronic stress in your life constantly, it can take a depreciation on your body. So when we look at um, stress disorders, you'll see what I mean about how it takes a toll on the immune system and the nervous system that can greatly affect somebody in the long run. Some examples of long-term stressors can include social isolation, serious illness, abusive environments, and occupational stress. Some occupational stress, and you're going to laugh when you see that list, are psychiatrists and psychologists. Go figure, huh? Usually the helping fields are the ones that suffer the most. Physicians, nurses, dentists, lawyers, police officers, farmers, and unskilled laborers have particularly high suicide rates. Um, that, I think, is a no-brainer right there as to why you think that is. They're encountering constant stress, aren't they, in their field, and we just finished talking about how stress can take a toll on that system. But more than anything, when we look at the stress disorders, you're going to find it has a great deal on the mind. Okay, and how we perceive and how we interact with our world. Now, many suicide attempts are preceded by changes in mood. You may notice um, that a person who is feeling suicidal um, may begin to change their behavior patterns. Some of the most common changes that um, is a rise in sadness, or you may even see people who get that Pollyanna effect where it's happy-go-lucky, everything's great, even though you know for a fact that nothing is great going on with them, that they're having a lot of issues, they have that real Pollyanna effect, okay? Um, there's increase in feelings of anxiety, tension, frustration, anger, or shame. Now, Schneidman calls this psychic. Okay, it's a feeling of psychological pain that seems intolerable to the person. And once again, that is just dealing with the stress. Having too much stress in your life, of course, it's going to have physiological symptoms on you, no doubt. You may get that chronic headache, um, migraines, uh, just an overall feeling of like having the flu. Too much stress will do that to you. It's the release of all the hormones into your system. And suicide attempts may also be preceded by shifts in patterns of thinking. Some become very preoccupied, or they lose perspective of things, or they become very agreeable. This is something I've noticed also. Um, and they see suicide as the only effective solution to their difficulties. They also develop that sense of hopelessness, a pessimistic outlook, as almost soon to follow that. And uh, most clinicians believe that the feeling of hopelessness is the single most likely indicator of suicidal intent. But like I said, that's not always the case. You get those people with the Pollyanna effect, or they act extremely happy, happier than what they've ever done, and they act like they're at peace, and that they're calm, and that's usually the calm before the storm, okay? People who attempt suicide fall victim to dichotomous thinking, viewing problems and solutions in rigid either-or terms. Um... 
The four-letter word in suicide is only, as in suicide was the only thing I could do. And they really believe that. Now, we do know that alcohol and drug use plays a huge factor and a huge role in suicide. Mood disorders, any time that we're dealing with depression, seems to be um, a big predetermer about people who do get suicidal. Now, those with mood disorders, substance use disorders, and their schizophrenia are at greater risk. And here's the part where you've seen a lot of movies and you've seen a lot of things on TV that talk about schizophrenia. It's like they glamorize it. When we start talking about that disorder, you're going to see there's nothing really glamorizing about it. it. Maybe if it's combined with another disorder, I can see that. But most schizophrenic people are not, um, aggra um, how can I say, sociopathic or um, wanting to hurt other people. Okay, They're not homicidal. They generally kind of resort to suicidal ideations and behaviors. In fact, I would venture to say that many schizophrenic patients will end up committing suicide for that reason. It is not unusual for people, particularly teenagers, to try to commit suicide after observing or reading about someone who has done so. It almost as if it represents some kind of a model or gives uh, an example of how to do it. Okay, Suicides by family members and friends, celebrities, other highly publicized suicides, and ones by co-workers are particularly common triggers for people. So what's the biggest thing is, um, I guess, working in an effort to, to do prevention programs, uh, teaching people the coping strategies for stress and for anxiety. Most people faced with difficult situations never try to kill themselves. In an effort to explain suicide proneness, theorists have proposed more fundamental explanations for self-destructive actions. Leading theories come from the psychodynamic, sociocultural, and biological perspectives. These hypotheses have received limited research support and failed to address the full range of suicidal acts. Freud, and we all love Freud, right? He proposed that it was the basic death instinct of Thanatos that operates in, in opposition to the life instinct. While most people learn to direct their death instinct toward others, suicidal people direct it towards themselves. And his theory about Thanatos is very interesting because he believed, remember, that all people were innately evil and that it would be our natural reaction or instinct to defend, protect ourselves, and turn outward like what it says is that we direct our death instinct towards others. However, for a suicidal person, it's not about um, this isn't working out for me and I, I can manage it this way or I can change things so that things will start to work better for me or I'm going to defend myself, it's more like they internally turn that into themselves and kind of give up. I guess that, that there is no easier way to define them. Then, of course, you have Durkheim's sociocultural view. And that view basically um, discuss how an attached person is to such social groups as the family, religious institutions, and community. And the more thoroughly a person belongs, the lower risk of suicide. He tends to think that when a person feels like they have nowhere or they feel ostracized or they're not part of a huger group, which takes us back to that whole theory, too, of what Maslow was saying about the love and belongingness and how it elevates our esteem. Without that, without association, remember I told you, human beings are social creatures. We were never meant to be alone. We were never meant to be by ourselves. So thus, when people feel that way, they feel like they just are not involved um, I would imagine that it would lead to that feeling, um, how can I say, well, loneliness is what it comes down to. It says that based on this premise, he developed several categories of suicide, including egoistic, altruistic, and anomic suicide. This is what a person might honestly believe that their death would represent if they killed themselves, okay? An egoistic suicide are committed by people over whom society has little or no control. So they're really all about themselves. And they may even show some really schizotypal um, behaviors, which we'll talk about, which is kind of like really not social outwardness. Then you got those altruistic suicides that are committed by people who are so well integrated into their society that they intentionally sacrifice their lives for its well-being. It's like they believe that they're a martyr. Okay. And then you got your anomic suicides are those committed by people whose social environment 
fails to provide stable structures that support and give meaning to life. Um, so it's those people who, I, I guess it would feel like constant disappointment or have such high expectations of what life has to offer and when it doesn't follow through, it becomes really suicidal. One person that brings to mind when I think about that is Marilyn Monroe. Okay, she, I believe she, hers was a very anomic suicide. A major change in an individual's immediate surroundings can also lead to this type of suicide. And it probably didn't help that the drugs and, and alcohol also contributed to that. Despite the influence of Durkheim's theory, it cannot by itself explain why some people who experience particular societal pressures commit suicide, while well, the majority do not. So it's like I tell you, I really believe that there is something internally, and the biological model would explain it, to say that it, it is part of the family pedigree. Okay, and it's, we've talked about what a pedigree is, right? It's really genetic, it's hereditary. Something is happening in there that a person is uh, unable to really rely on that prefrontal cortex that we talked about that is responsible for logic and for planning and execution. Rather than do that, the person is just resorting to, I guess, emotional reactions. For example, there are higher rates of suicide among the parents and close relatives of those people who commit suicide than among non-suicidal people. So once we see this in a family, it's almost, um, it's almost as if it's going to be a tendency. We'll see it again. Maybe is this due to a shared environment that they're both under the same roof and they're both ex experiencing the same environment and they're both responding to it in a very similar way. Now, there is no known link between low serotonin and depression. So remember I was saying, I really believe that there is something going on in the brain. It, I don't believe it's hormone related though, and I, neither does the biological view, okay? Because laboratory research has shown that maybe that's not the case. But there is evidence of low serotonin among suicidal subjects with no history of depression. And we know that in depression, there tends to be low serotonin. So maybe that has something to do with it. Because low serotonin activity, as it states here, does contribute to aggressive and impulsive behaviors. And would we not rank suicide as an impulsive behavior? Rather than a person resorting to their problem-solving abilities, once again, they resort to suicide. The likelihood of committing suicide increases with age, although people of all ages may try to kill themselves. We are seeing this more and more in three different age groups, children, adolescents, and the elderly just as I said, but I don't know in which order. Uh, I think that varies per city, per state, per town. But we are seeing it a lot more frequently in children, and you would think that that wouldn't be the case because I don't know what it is that as a society we tend to think that children are not capable of those things or capable of that way of thinking, but they really are. And just in recent times, okay, I would say within the past six months, We've had a number of children committing suicide, and one of the youngest ones was a six-year-old. A six-year-old who stated that he heard his parents arguing about money. They were having financial problems, and they were on the verge of a divorce. And he thought that it was because of him, so he felt that if he was no longer in existence, mom and dad wouldn't have to worry about money, and he hung himself from his own bunk bed. And that wasn't too long ago. Okay, Boys outnumber girls by as much as five to one. So that's, once again, a very huge number. And those are usually between the ages of 10 and 14. But this was a six-year-old, okay? Children, suicide attempts by the very young, generally, are preceded by such behavioral patterns as running away, accident proneness, temper tantrum, self-criticism, social withdrawal, dark fantasies, and marked personality changes. Despite common misperceptions, many child suicides appear to be based on a clear understanding of death and out of a clear wish to die. We thought many years ago that children didn't understand how concrete death in life was, but the truth is, is they really do. And um, the age of reason, however, we know it happens around seven years of age. And when I say age of reason, that means because they cannot tell the difference between wrong and right and what's definite. But make no mistake of it that children do understand death. They understand that it's permanent. They may not understand the effects of it, what happens, um, the pain that may follow, only because maybe of what they see on TV. But I, I think we're in a different generation than we were a long time ago, where the worst violence you could possibly see were in cartoons. 
and children were seeing, okay, the roadrunner blows up, the roadrunner gets run over by a truck, and he's still alive. So for them, that didn't define death. But now we're seeing a lot more children are exposed to more um, extreme understandings of, of what death and life is and violence. We do see a lot of uh, adolescents committing suicide, but I think I see a lot more in self-mutilation going on right now. And, and to me, that's an outcry. And I would think that most clinicians would view it as an outcry as well. About half of teen suicides have been tied to clinical depression, low self-esteem, and feelings of hopelessness. Anger, impulsiveness, poor problem-solving skills, substance use, and stress also play a role. Some theorists believe that the period of adolescence itself produces a stressful climate in which suicidal actions are more likely. So we know that to be the case. And once again, it gives you an outline of those ethnicities. But now let's get to the elderly portion. And elderly are more likely to commit suicide because there's a number of contributory factors like illness, loss of close friends and relatives, the loss of control over one's life, and loss of social status. That seems to be a huge one. Right now, in my senior group alone, like I told you, I have a total of 10 seniors right now, all of which have, su have had suicidal ideations at what point in time. And it's usually for these reasons. you got some that are, are battling a terminal illness or a disability that they just recently encountered, and it really bothers them to know, here go my faculties, here go my ability to perform and do the things that I used to do. So this has become a really big issue for the elderly right now. Elderly persons are typically more determined than younger persons in their decision to die, so their success rate is much higher. And that is, I think, the lack of fear and uh, the lack of concern and not feeling like they still have life to live, things to look forward to. In their case, they're imagining that most of their friends and family have gone now, uh, so the, who's going to miss them? Okay, so treatment of suicidal persons falls into two categories. Treatment after suicide has been attempted and suicide prevention. And that's really what it comes down to, is after a person has attempted, we can work on psychotherapy, we can do drug therapy for depression, for anti-anxiety medications to stabilize the mind, right? Uh, once they're medically stable, it you know we can only hope that they are able to progress uh, without going into some kind of relapse. Uh, portion of the treatment. However, that's not always the case because we often find that people who have attempted before, they could go through the treatment, they could feel a little bit better, but then when they get back out there, that's it. They commit. So what are our therapy goals? It's pretty simple. Okay, Keep the patient alive, whether that's through a safety contract, whether that's putting them inpatient, whether it's getting to the point where like now what we're doing too with some of our military people is we are following up with the MPs on base. They're going into the home, they're checking. Of course, in the civilian world, we can't be that evasive, right? But we're making sure that they have no weapons within their reach. Um, but we're doing everything we possibly can. We do welfare checks. We do things of that nature, okay? Uh, reduce psychological pain. That's a big one. Help them achieve a non-suicidal state of mind and a sense of hope. Instilling hope is very difficult, but I think when you get them together in a group setting, it tends to be more effective than individual therapy. Guide them to develop better ways of handling stress. And uh, I find that CBT therapies, cognitive behavioral therapies, are very helpful because we have to work on that cognitive restructuring. It's their perception that gets them into thinking that they're hopeless. Or it's their perception that leads to their mood and their mood alters their emotions and their emotions get the body feeling a certain way and then that's it. We make sure we always uh, hook them up with uh, crisis hotlines, uh, provide crisis intervention um, numbers and support groups. Our general approach to suicidal patients is establishing a positive relationship. You may be that only steady figure in their lives. Understanding and clarifying the problem if you can clarify and define the problem, then you're better able to identify skills. Assess suicide potential, once again, is the intent, the plan, the lethality there. Assessing and mobilizing the caller's resources and formulating the plan. When you get to that point of, of hopelessness, do you have people that you can turn to? Are there people that you can call? Now, we there's a bunch of programs out there that are available, especially here in El Paso, and especially, you know, uh, several crisis intervention programs out there as well. 
But it's all about hooking them up with the right resources and giving them that stability that they're lacking right now. So that's suicide in a nutshell. I'll see you back in a minute for the substance abuse and then we'll look at eating disorders.